Welcome to Documentary First, an inside look at a first time filmmaker's journey. I'm your host, Josh Lindsay from the Movie Proposal Podcast. And with us is our so-called first time filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hello, Josh Lindsay. Hi, Jason. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you again or hear you again. Looks like you're back home, Christian, in I, Wheaton, Illinois. I am. It's very nice to be home. I think it's been about three weeks. I forgot where I lived. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, and with us, as always, he never leaves home. It's Jason Rugg. Hey there. <laughs> He's actually gone out. You got a taco or two recently, didn't you? I did. Yeah. And a cinnamon roll. Mm. A lot of cinnamon rolls. <laughs> Too many. <laughs> Those probably don't go well together. But No, no. <laughs> okay. And with us, our special guest from two episodes ago, the filmmaker, veteran extraordinaire, George Champa. Thank you for being with us, George. I had three episodes, wasn't it? Uh, He's done three episodes, but it's been two episodes since we've had you on. Oh. So, uh, yeah, we missed two weeks and we did miss you very much. We wanted to get you back because you left us with a cliffhanger. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we get to the cliffhanger, let's have another cliffhanger and put pause on that. Christian, is there anything we need to update about the film? Well, I will kind of give you a brief overview. It's been an exciting three weeks. We, uh, I went on this big road trip where I had a family graduation, a family wedding, wonderful time with my family in Tennessee and Kentucky. And then I headed to South Carolina where we did the Reedy Reels Film Festival. And I'm happy to report we won the Best Veteran Film Award at Reedy Reels. Uh, it was a super wonderful experience. And we had David Chapman there, who was Colonel David Chapman in our film. We had Bill Ebel, the editor. Sam King was with us. And then uh, we Virginie Durr and Denis Grizzo was there. And that was actually on D-Day. So we had a wonderful D-Day experience in Greenville, South Carolina. Then we got in the car and we drove four hours to Beaufort, South Carolina. We arrived at like 6 p.m. And we um, were part of the Beaufort Film Society's fundraiser that they had. Uh, that was a wonderful experience. Um, I would thank you so much, Ron and Rebecca Tucker. They are just phenomenal at creating these events for filmmakers. It was a rainy day. We were supposed to be in a garden party, but they quickly scrambled, put us all inside in a great venue. Uh, there were wine and uh, sodas and water, and everybody came there to watch the film. And Denis, um, Virginie Durr and her children were there. Her children were able to share about how meaningful D-Day has been in their family life. And Virginie shared how she had sort of passed down from her grandmother to her children, uh, how important it is to celebrate our veterans and our liberation on D-Day. So we had a great event there. Then we got in the car on the 7th. We drove to Atlanta, Georgia, and we had dinner with executives from Delta and Michelin. Um, many people may have seen that posted on our social media pages. We got together to talk about uh, just partnerships between Delta and Michelin and uh, also between the Girl Who Wore Freedom. The next day on June 8th, we did a recorded town hall with uh, some Delta uh, employees and some Michelin employees, David Chapman, I, Jim Graham, and the French uh, Council General to Atlanta. And um, his name is Vincent Amariel. He was there as well. And that town hall will be showed to all Delta employees on um, in August when our film debuts on the airplane. One of the things that I'm embarrassed about, but also very excited about, was the morning that I woke up in the hotel at the Atlanta airport overlooking the runway. I went outside on my balcony and I was looking at the planes and a big sign that said fly Delta jets. And it dawned on me, hmm, one of our cast members um, was a pilot. And I wondered if he flew for Delta. And I looked up Mike Strasberg and sure enough, he's been flying for Delta for 30 years. Wow. 
And so that was a unique coincidence that I discovered that morning. Um, just to remind everybody, uh, Mike Strasberg and I went to high school together. Uh, when he saw on Facebook, I was doing this project. It spurred him to investigate his own grandfather's World War II history. He discovered that his grandfather, Alan Hopper, was with the 92nd Chemical Mortar Battalion. And he fought all the way through the war and would write his dearest daughter, Patty, um, and talk to her about what it was like in France. And so we have that little section in our film. And we thought it was really great that we discovered he too was connected to Delta. So that was a, a super fun, wonderful event and experience. We talked about doing some more exciting things in the future. Uh, Delta is interested in bringing over some of our veterans in the film, as well as maybe even Danny and uh, Jean-Marie for something during Veterans Week in November and partnering um, with Michelin um, and Fort Bragg to have a veterans event. Apparently, Fort Bragg is opening up in their museum an exhibit that features Normandy and the D-Day events. So they've asked us to come and be a part of that event in November when they open and dedicate that little um, that little museum exhibit. So that was super fun. Um, when I got home yesterday, I received the awards from the GI Film Festival. I'm going to grab one off my shelf. Hold on. So if you're uh, watching, you can see this really cool, fun, uh, wonderful award. If not, you will just have to dream about it. It's a big crystal award. Uh, I'm so happy to have won that from the GI Film Festival. We won the best first time filmmaker and the best. Um, documentary. So that was pretty neat. So uh, what's next? Um, I guess we didn't even talk about the fact that uh, the film has released. We have five stars on iTunes. We have 125 reviews. The sad news is while on D-Day, we like peaked at number seven on the iTunes documentary chart. Like yesterday, when I looked, we were 86 and I was so depressed. I didn't even want to look at it today. Um, but those ratings are very volatile. They change all the time, like every hour. So uh, I just can't think about that too much. Um, and we're just continuing on to try to uh, get people to watch, rate, and review the film. Um, also, I want to tell you, there's a lot of people that don't have iTunes or don't know how to get it. Um, and we are starting to curate a list of people that want a DVD. So we are going to have DVDs made. If you want a DVD and you want to be able to watch it now, um, please email me Christian at Normandy stories.com. We'll add you to our DVD list. Uh, and then, you know, you'll be able to watch it even though you don't have iTunes. So there you go. There's my report in a nutshell. Very exciting. Can All I right. say we are before we get on? I need to talk to you about a project that I'm going to be doing that you're going to be involved in, I hope. Okay. Yeah, and absolutely. Uh, uh, and, uh, and the other thing is, hold on a minute. <laughs> you heard it first, folks. This is how it happens. Someone <laughs> meets someone, they join a podcast, and they say, hey, I want you to be in my You know, this project. is my birthday, and here's my <laughs> champagne right here. Yes, we have to toast you. Okay, George, happy birthday. We're going to sing to you and I'm going to toast you in my D-Day St. Mary Glees mug. Uh, and so this is really water. How old are you today, George? 96. 96. Oh, so yeah. um, many years ago, I think probably around 77, George, this day was in Normandy. He was part of the Gray's Registration Service. We're thankful he made it through that. He's sitting with here uh, us here today. If you haven't heard all of his stories, this is now his fourth episode. Go back and listen. Uh, George's life is amazing. So, George, we want to toast you, and we want to say thank you for everything that you've done for our film, our country, uh, and for the free world. Uh, and so, we're going to sing you happy birthday and. Here we go. Salut. Salut. All right, Jason and Josh, you got to sing with me. This happy, is not part birthday of happy birthday to, to you. you. 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear George. Happy birthday to you and many more. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay. All right. I better put the glass back before I drop it and break it. And my wife will give me help. <laughs> Don't want to have that. So Christian, you now have another project. This is what, number 21, 22? Yeah, so George uh, has talked to me about this briefly, George. And we're going to get to George's film career in just a minute. But uh, George does have a film he'd like to have translated into French. I'm going to help him with that. We'll work out the details off the podcast. But yes, this is what oh. happens among filmmakers. You see and meet each other and you then work together, hopefully. Yeah, hope so. Hope All right, so. Josh, lead us back into uh, to oh. where we were when we last left off with George. I, I Well, I'm going to need help here. He, he, he found this wonderful woman he's traveling around Germany with a part ways and somehow George do you remember where you left off <laughs> are you kidding me I don't even know what I had for dinner last night <laughs> you, you have a <laughs> you, you have hands down last night? you have a better memory than anyone else in this podcast so come to think of it I know what I had I had moved so you freaks you know what that is That's, uh, well? something and and french fries yeah, mules, mules. That's like clams, mules. You know what mules are? Oh, yeah, mussels and fries. Yeah, mussels. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how to speak English anymore. Just, yeah, mules is the word for mussels, and, and, and frites is fries. Yes. And, and frites was initiated in, in Belgium, not France. That's true. They, they cook them differently than they do in France, also. Somehow they got the, the, uh, the, gnome, the name of French fries, but really it's Belgian fries. They'll, they'll tell you that in Belgium. And they're really good. They cook them twice. It's, it's a pr process there they do that's different than what the French do. All right. So, George, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, all right. But, but here, I, I do remember where we were. When oh, we oh. last met, we were talking with you. You had taken us through the end of the war, and you were now as part of the sustainment forces. I think you were there for seven months. Uh, you had commandeered a jeep, uh, sort of illegally. Uh, you had uh, taken this lovely uh, trapeze artist, I think she was, that you had met in Germany, driven her around from event to event. Eventually, you kind of got in trouble. You had to give the jeep back. And uh, the war ended and you came back home. And then I think we asked you, well, what happened? Did you ever see this lovely woman again? And you started to tell us, and that's where we left off. So oh, you to start there. Yes, please. Can you remind us of her name? Margot. Margot. So tell us whatever happened with Margot. Well, I don't know. I mean, she she may be dead for all I know. She was four months older than, than I. So she, uh, she was 96 four months ago in February. But she's still living. I thought, I'd write, I thought I'd write to the house in Frankfurt um, where she lived to see if anybody knows of her. I did that about a, a, a Belgian girl a long time ago. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> that's another story. Out there. You, won't, you won't believe that story. Okay, well, guess what, George? I'm going to ask you that story, and that will be the bonus episode we're going to give to our Patreon listeners. So as soon as we're done with this, I'm going to ask you about the Belgian girl. But go okay. ahead with Margot. Tell okay. us uh, when you said goodbye, and did you ever see her again? Okay, first of all, I didn't commandeer the Jeep. I just borrowed it. I borrowed it. Okay. Okay. But anyway, I did have a Jeep, and uh, but I already talked to you about that. So let's get to the first time I saw her again was in 1949 uh and so that was uh what four years later and uh, uh and so she was 24 like i was but anyway she was in a circus in the ringling brothers in in milwaukee before that she had been in new york and fell off the trapeze and broke her back but then when her back got better she didn't go back on a trapeze but you know you see these girls in circuses that climb up ropes and kind of swing around on a rope. She was doing that anyway. Anyway, yeah, she uh, 
she was kind of different uh, than she was in Germany because, you know, in Germany, in the circus, you're a real celebrity. Here, here you're just a circus girl. And uh, I tell people that, that I had, had a, a girlfriend in, in Germany that was on the flying, no, I didn't say on the flying train, on the flying trapeze. I just said I had a, I had a girlfriend who was in a circus uh, in Germany, and, and the wise guys would say, oh, the bearded woman, you know, <laughs> I said, no, she was on a flying trapeze, and she was very pretty, she was with her sister and another girl, and her sister was very pretty, too, they were both pretty, anyway, uh, I met her, uh, she, now she could speak English pretty well, where she couldn't before, and uh, and now it, it was a whole different ball game, really, and it might be because I saw this other girl there that was from Georgia <laughs> and the uh, Georgia peach. And you know, these girls that, that, that put one foot on one horse and the other foot on another horse and they go around. So that's what she was doing. But I kept in touch with Margot after that, but nothing ever came of it. You know, every, everything changed. Now I'm back in the US chasing girls here when I was 20, I was uh, 20 years old. Uh, and uh, when I came home, I was 20 and a half. Couldn't even buy a beer. Have to get other people to buy the beer for us. And uh, go and get these quarts of Miller High Life. Uh, that, so, so that's pretty much the end of it with my girl. Uh, I never did um, write to her anymore. And, you know, things change. And, and uh, what can I tell you, you know? And uh, I had a lot of different girlfriends until until I got married, I, I was, I didn't get married till I was 42. Ooh. Yeah, and so I I did have a few girlfriends from the time <laughs> I was 20 to, till I was 42. I bet that, you did. 20 years, isn't it? My God. That's a long it. time. Kudos to the woman that finally caught you. Yeah, well, there's a couple of gals I was really in love with, but they, one was in love with me. She was from Kentucky, and, uh, and but uh, she, you couldn't touch her until you had married her. You know, that's the way it was in those days. In those days, it was different than, you know, in the 60s and, 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 and on. Um, now, now, you know, girls are quick to jump in bed with you. But this gal from Tennessee, she made it clear, keep your hands off till we get married. So again, I didn't think I was old enough to get married. And uh, then there was another gal that I liked, but I guess she didn't like me. That, that kind of broke my heart a bit. So anyway, that's that's the way it is. It's life in, in the fast lane. So uh, at the end of Margo, now you want me to talk about uh, something else? Yeah, so my next question to you is, I know that you had a career uh, from, you know, from your army days, uh, to, you know, actually now, uh, and I really want to touch on the things in between then and now, uh, only briefly, because I want to spend the bulk of our time talking about, uh, the, the career choice you made at 81. So it's my understanding that you went from the army and eventually landed at the LA times. Is that right? Yeah, eventually. Yeah. I worked for newspapers all together for about over 30 years. And I was in display advertising. I was a salesman selling selling advertising, and uh, and I used to call on ad agencies a lot. I'll never forget one time when I called on an ad agency, and and the guy said, "You've got two minutes." I said, "Goodbye." I got up and walked out. And uh, so when anybody tells me I have two minutes, that's the end of the conversation <laughs> because I can't have stop myself at two minutes i can't even get started i just get my breath two minutes so, as you know so anyway yeah i finally ended up at the times because what happened this is the la times um i i got a taste of construction because my brother was a general contractor and i developed one of the first condominiums in california back in 1963 and uh it was a long process of getting me into the condominium because before the condominiums, 
were co-ops after co-ops that was own your own apartment and then condominiums. And so uh, condominiums was a, the best ownership than the other two, where you get your, have your own tax bill, you have your own mortgage, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I had explained to people the difference between the three and I had maps on the wall. I had a little house, a gentleman owned this house. He was an old bachelor, uh, an old, older man. And, uh, and so I talked him into selling me his house, but I didn't have any money. <laughs> and so, so what I did is I got a second trust deed uh, on his house and I got to use his living room. He still lived there in the rest of the house. I had, had I used his living room for uh, uh, for renderings, you know, and uh, explaining everything about condos versus the other ownerships. And out in front of the place had a huge sign I got from the Edison Company because it was an all electric, sixteen unit, a uh, three story, full subterranean garage, the very first subterranean garage without posts, so you didn't have to drive around posts. It was clear space. They build freeways now. But this was in 63. Anyway, it was a beautiful place called the Florentine. It had a fountain out in front. My father was big on fountains. And, uh, and, and so it called the Florentine. And it's still there, by the way, except I lost, I lost it. It was a sad story in my life. I got a guy that says, hey, George, I'm going to help you with the financing of this thing. Because I was trying to put an investment group together. He said, no, why give away all your profit? I'll build a place for you for $2,000. I'll get you the financing and everything. Well, I had $120,000 projected profit in it. And so I thought I had an angel. Turned out he was a devil. He ended up with my project after I put a lot of work in it. I lost it in 1965. And, uh, but I broke ground on the day the legislation was passed, which was September 20th, 1963. And, and there was only two other condominiums ahead of me. And I still have all that paper, blah, 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 in my garage. But anyway, it was a sad story, really. I was living home at home with my mother at the time. My father had passed away in 62. Uh, and so it, it, uh, it, was, uh, it was a sad time for me. And so finally, uh, I went to work for the LA Times, which I had experience in doing that and uh, for like 30, almost 30 years. And so I ended up times 24 years, but I was a salesman for eight years. And then I did such a great job, <laughs> gonna brag now, because I was very creative in coming up with special ideas uh, for special I can't ideas. imagine. And so they made me special features manager. And I did that for 18 years. And uh, I worked with the Dodgers and I used to get free seats at the Dodgers. and. And by the way, the Dodgers had a big game last night. And, uh, they won it. I uh, saw that. Did you see that game? For I... the first time, they filled the house. Uh, 50,000 people there. It's the first time anyone's filled the house since this pandemic. Yep. And the fans went crazy when the game was over. Did you see that whole thing? Yep, yep. It's big it news. Was, it was wild. They played Philadelphia. Anyway, uh, at the times... I had, I was my own boss. I mean, I had an ad director over me, but he just left me alone because he had a huge job. He was in charge of everything going on in New York and Florida, Hawaii. And uh, we had a lot of zones and it was a big, big operation. So anyway, uh, I, I had a fantastic deal. I had, I could even go to the Picasso room and take guests there for lunch. So then my lunch was free. They even had cigars hand out to your guests. And I used to grab a bunch of them and take them back to the office because I was smoking cigars for a while. And I'd go in my office after lunch and smoke a cigar when you can do that. <laughs> and, and, uh, but anyway, I quit, I quit smoking cigars in 1981 when my late wife was still in the hospital and dying. And I haven't touched a cigar since 1981. Uh, but anyway, I uh, had, had a very good job there. And uh, at one time, I was a zone manager close to where I lived. And uh, my boss came to see me one day. And he says, uh, we want to give you 
new position, special features manager, got to come back downtown. Well, I didn't want to go downtown. It's close to home. Uh, so I said, I'll think about it. And he says, maybe you don't want to be in the limelight. This is the way he used to talk, you know. Maybe you don't want to be in the limelight. So anyway, I went downtown. I was, I was there for 18 years. So uh, that was my, my job there. Now, uh, and of course, my wife was ill at the time there when I was a zone manager close to home, and I didn't want to go downtown. He said, don't worry about that. He says, we'll take care of that. So he was very, very good to me. Uh, so anyway, uh, it, uh, it, 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 um, the, let's, let's get away from the job now. What happened uh, years later in 19, uh, uh, when the hell was it? I was 81 years old, and uh, I just in 2006, I decided I had to do something after talking to a retired general and colonel that were in charge of the museum in Wheaton, Illinois. I met the general before that, and uh, they both talked me into taking teachers to Europe to teach them some reverence. Because what was happening is there was a cemetery there called Henri Chapelle. It was the biggest cemetery at one time. Uh, it's got uh, uh, like uh, 8,000 are buried there now. At one time, when I was there, we had the temporary cemetery there. And we had uh, 17,300 buried in, in what was farmland. Yeah, you and told there. us that. Okay, I told you that. Okay, so uh, what happened was my friends that have a museum about two miles from that permanent cemetery called me one day and said, George, you got to help us. People from the Netherlands, you know, drugs are legal in the Netherlands and come into the Overlook area on their bicycle, bicycles and cars, and they're running the bicycles through the cemetery. And, uh, you know, uh, the police can't do anything about it here. And they're afraid of the peaceful, blah, blah, blah. So I took hold of this project in 2005. And for one year, I tried to get gates on that cemetery. There's no, still no gates on the cemetery. I, I talked to everybody I knew, TV, newspapers, John McCain, Elizabeth Dole was a senator then in North Carolina, and uh, they were trying to help me. Nobody could help me to get gates on that cemetery. And a general in charge of it, uh, he, he, uh, he wrote me a, a letter because I got people were just driving them crazy, all these people I had contacted. And so he said, we don't want to put gates on that cemetery to give it a fortress-like appearance and discourage people from going there. And I said, what? What do you think? The other cemeteries are. This is the only cemetery that doesn't have gates. And so anyway, uh, what happened is they decided to do some minor things there, like put some security lights, they, and they built some hedges, and, but the motorcycles could go through the hedges. It was crazy what they did there. Uh, but uh, finally, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, what am I trying to say, in Brussels, the the uh, I can't think of the name of the organization now. Big big organizations they have in every country. The Maybe the that. Battle Monuments Commission. Yeah, no, the Battle Monuments Commission is in Arlington, Virginia. They're the ones that, that built the, the permanent cemeteries. Right. And I, and I even fought with with them. I mean, I I was the persona non grata, is that what they say? <laughs> because everybody knew I was trying to get gates on that cemetery and I wasn't quitting. And so then they put these little things there, you know, it did get better with what they did, but I still didn't get the gates on. Um, it's the only uh, military cemetery over there, World War I or no, World War I, there is what they call an open cemetery, just like Andre Chappelle's called it an open cemetery. But all the rest of the World War I cemeteries and World War II cemeteries, cemeteries all have gates. I get all shook up thinking about it because because they should have gates. Even private cemeteries here in the U.S. have gates for crying out loud, you know. So uh, I even was going to finance the thing. I was getting somebody to build the the gates so that people couldn't. Go. And then they had a, a restroom on the outside of the cemetery. 
the people on tours as the road goes right by there people on tours get out of their buses and they use the, the restrooms that belong to the cemetery and they still do that by the way so it's it's a beautiful cemetery all the cemeteries over there are beautiful more so than than the Arlington cemetery we have here because of the the uh, markers are white marble imported from Italy and they're beautiful and the, 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 the citizens there are paid, they have people on the payroll to do all the, the lawn mowing and taking care of. So they're very beautiful cemeteries. If you've ever, never been there and you go to Europe, you've got to visit an American military cemetery. Well, can I stop you right there, George? I hate interrupting you. I would let you talk for hours because everything that you have to say is fascinating to me. And but I also don't want to skimp on anything. And we are running short in this hour um, because I do want to leave time to do a special thing for our Patreon um, supporters. And I still want you to tell your filmmaking career and spend time on your movies. So I'm going to have to see if we can have you come back one more time so we could focus exclusively on the filmmaking part. Would you be able to do that with us? Yeah, but just, let me say quickly, that's how I got in into becoming a filmmaker at age 81, uh, because of going over there with teachers on the first two films. I took teachers. I took uh, four teachers the first time in first film and two teachers on the second film. Plus, I took combat veterans that served in those areas. That's how I got in, into filmmaking because of, of that. Okay. So the next time we have you back, then we'll hear more about those. I want you to tell us about, you know, all of your movies out there, but until we get to that, give us the website where people can go and read more about you. Of course, www.letfreedomringforall.org. F-O-R, for, let freedom ring for all.org. And, and the website has just been reconstructed, looking better now than it was. And you can see excerpts of all of my films on the website and a lot more. Great. Awesome. Thank you very much for that. Um, we will have you back. We'll set a time uh, offline in just a minute about for when you can come back. Uh, so I want to talk to you guys about our Patreon supporters. First of all, I am completely overwhelmed. We've barely even um, launched this effort and we already have um, $309 in pledges um, from, I think it's about 10 different members. Yeah, we have 10 Patreons right now and uh, they're, they're supporting us at $300, uh, $309 a month. So uh, I just, you know, one of the things is we want to give everybody a shout out on air. So I want to do that really quickly. Um, Pam Thaggart, Thank you very much. Benjamin Smith, we're delighted to have you um, at the $25 a month level. James Huberger, he was the very first one that encouraged me to set up a Patreon. Um, you're at the Angleville en plan level two. I thank you so much for that. Joanne Trotman is such an incredible blessing. She's at the Utah beach level. Uh, if you haven't checked out those perks, you sure, certainly should. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, Catherine Paris, what a lovely last name. She's at the St. Home Dumont level, Erica Iverson. She's one of my Holy Post podcast friends. Thank you. Um, you're at the Turkville level along with Sheila Breeden um, and Peter Flood. Thank you so much, Peter. You're at the um, St. Home Dumont level as well. Michael Strasberg, our sweet Delta pilot is also a supporter. Thank you, Michael. And, uh, and Mindy Cook. And speaking of Mindy Cook, Mindy Cook is going to be on the show coming up here soon. She's one of our new team members at the Guerrilla War Freedom, and she's been helping out a lot with the Patreon. Um, if you guys did not read the email that I sent the Patreon supporters yesterday, there's a little video thank you message in there for me. So check your email. Um, and if you're listening to this podcast and haven't checked out our Patreon plays, 
page, please do that. There are lots of really cool perks there that are going to start up in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, we're going to start fulfilling all of those perks. And so we'd love to have you support us. Um, that movie, uh, that money goes to help paying our bills for the girl who wore freedom, uh, as well as if we can get up, our base goal is to get up to $400 a month. I'm going to start shuttling money to Jason, uh, Josh and Jason Hoban. Uh, that's definitely going to happen. So anyway, thank you guys for your support. You can go to the girl who wore freedom.com, uh, to check out the new news for us on all of our social media as well. Uh, and check out our shop. So Josh, that's about all the news that's fit to print today. Actually, I was going to say one quick yeah. thing. Uh, the Patreon is patreon.com forward slash doc first podcast. So that's thank how you can you. find it. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. That's There's awesome. Here. I can't see you guys moving. I can hear you. <laughs> all right, George. Well, we'll solve that right after this break. Josh, take us out. Okay. Well, George, thanks for being with us today. And thank you, listener for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Yes, you can. Bye, everybody. Bye.